Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Airlock, and this is a following talk, part two of a two-part talk, of many talks, on Poe philosophy, and this is the second part on the murder, I believe, that is in the murders in the Rue Morgue. So, I already mentioned a bunch about how Poe's story is possibly the first murder mystery, and the plot twists, and the Wittgenstein, etc., so please see all of that. So now we're simply going to work through the story, and I will show what I've already been telling. So the narrator starts his story after struggling with its meaning, telling us he was from a great family, fallen on hard times, and gets by with books and little else. He meets Dupin in a library, searching for the same rare book. Dupin kindles the spirit of the narrator, and the narrator rents a large abandoned mansion for them both to live in, fitting their gloomy mood. Quite goth. This makes Dupin the mind and the narrator the body. Quite much. Much like Holmes is the mind and Doc Watson thus would be a bit the physician, the physical, and the body. The two withdraw from the world and live like madmen, existing within themselves alone, as it's quoted. They don't know Paris, and Paris doesn't know them. Poe didn't know Paris because he never went there. Never went to France. They live in darkness inside during the day and go out at night, walking and talking together, as Poe did with his teenage friends. Dupin has weak eyes, but a powerful imagination that is sensitive. He has inner eyes and inner sight, which compensates for his lack of vision. If he had sharp eyes, he could see even more clues, but his inner sight is even better and compensates for, and he does use his eyes to see, but he also can use his mind even more. So he avoids daylight and crowds and stays in the dark, which helps him think and imagine. As I mentioned, he is possibly the central inspiration for Sherlock Holmes along with others. Dupin, Poe's detective, and the first major short story murder mystery twist detective in modern media. And he, unlike Holmes, is not insensitive to the emotions of others and somewhat impervious and just not understanding and seen as insensitive that he actually can't go out in daytime and talk to people, too many people at once, because he feels too much what everyone thinks and feels and therefore can read their minds, as he then immediately now demonstrates what the narrator has told us. So the narrator, in my first talk on this story, goes on in that monologue I overanalyzed along with connecting it with other things. And then, we now have the narrator uh, explaining a setup which now he will show. One night, they are out walking. Dupin amazes his friends by reading his mind, showing how he can watch someone's eyes and see what they are seeing, which again, he immediately, we have the eyes, even though his are not good listens to the sounds they make and watches their expression to feel what they are feeling and can follow their train of thought. Dupin tells his friend, most people have a window over their hearts. He can see right through, which mirrors what the narrator just told us in the rambling intro in which he is trying to summarize the philosophy of his friend and put it into words, and he does so poorly because it is the inner meaning and spirit somewhat and not simply the words or the eyes nor the ears. But he says he can watch someone's eyes and see what they are seeing, listens to the sounds they make, and watch their expression, which would be sight, sound, and emotion. And he shows a plurality of elements intermixed and interwoven, as Carol's sheep somewhat demonstrates, and then Wittgenstein is obsessed with a bit, is no basement intertangle on the surface, organically, of simple elements. Otherwise, we couldn't say anything, as far as we perceive and understand it. But that he can see, hear, and feel for others. When he says, watch their expressions, you can listen to the tone in somebody's voice, watch their expressions, and then you feel what they feel as you feel what you feel about what they feel and pay more or less attention to that as you pay more attention to your back as you sit in a chair and talk. That much as the narrator said, a great card player plays as if others have their cards turned outward, he says, others have a window over their hearts for me because I pay attention to their expression and I pay attention to their emotional point of what they're saying, perhaps, occasionally, and I can read others like psychics and seem a genius, at least seem a genius, and this is, of course, thus being productive, I suppose. 
the Tao Te Ching says, and I love comparing this stuff to Taoism because there's so much overlap, even if the French folks didn't carry it over to Poe. The Tao Te Ching says most people parade their foolish judgments in front of others, but the wise few don't and can read others easily. It says that at this or here and there, but interspersed, it clearly says that overall. And that the sage, like nature, loves to hide, as Heraclitus says. Soon after this, the nocturnal duo read in an evening paper, which is the test here of what... So the narrator has been... There is an opening quote, then there's the narrator's monologue, then there's the narrator describing the situation, and then there's the narrator saying, on a walk, here's what happened and how he explained it. So we have several levels... And it keeps working exactly in sequence to back up what just happened and extend it. It's nice and simple and profound. The way that Poe works the story and the plot elements, which is what he's doing and thinks he does better than anyone. I have to say he is exceptional. Yes, many think so. So they read in a paper, here's the test, here's the case, that at three that morning, shrieks were heard from the house of Madame and Mademoiselle L'Espagne which is a very fake, the Spanish as a last name. So it's French people from Spain as a Spanish family living in France. And they're called, it's like Mr. and Mrs. Spanish in French, which is nice and stupid and fake and simple. Almost like a child came up with it. This makes, if you feel and read between the lines, this makes the mother and daughter Spanish ladies. And unfortunately, it very well could be that he is aware of, not of Jaws, but of the similar sea shanty, which was popular in Poe's day, and his brother was a sailor, and his brother loved to sing and carouse, apparently. That's, well, you say farewell to ye, old, to ye Spanish ladies, yes? And there you go, as the old song goes. So, and we'll say no, nothing else and head to port. A crowd breaks into the front door, hearing the shrieks in the house, of the Spanish ladies, and enters with two armed officers. They hear voices upstairs, one speaking French and another shrieking something none of the mixed crowd understand. So they run upstairs past three abandoned floors to a locked door, which they force open, finding a fourth flo floor room, holding a horrifying scene. All the furniture is smashed, a bloody mattress sits in the middle of the room, a bloody razor on a chair, clumps of hair by the fireplace, and two bags of 4,000 gold francs and loose silver coins, spoons and jewelry on the floor. A small open safe under the mattress with a key in the door is empty other than a few old letters and papers. The corpse of the daughter is found stuffed, forgive me, this is not going to be pleasant, stuffed head downwards up the chimney, which is a very strange way of a corpse, with scratches on her face and bruises on her neck, true crime, but fiction as if she had been throttled to death. After searching the rest of the house, they find the mother's mutilated corpse in the backyard with her throat cut so deeply, her head falls off when they take hold of her. Now that's really giving a kick in the pants to your audience, uh, given they can feel human emotion. A doctor later says the daughter's tongue is partly bitten through. This again, speaking of speech and uh, the audible, etc. again, and the visceral, possibly by her, and the body of the mother was smashed as if a strong man with a large blunt object could have done it. The paper says there isn't the slightest clue to solve the mystery yet. The laundry lady says mother and daughter were happy and paid her well, and she never saw any strangers or servants in the house, nor furniture outside the upper room. This pairs women again with furniture, like the philosophy of furniture, possibly. Oh, it does in the middle, and then I claim it does, I think, in the end, even though it says a he. And both are destroyed. All the furniture smashed, the women smashed. Hulk smash. Like Dupin and the narrator, mother and daughter live by themselves, mind over body, adult over child. In fact, in both cases, in all of this, there's the themes of that going on. And if the body is vacant and empty and they don't know Paris, Paris doesn't know them. They are way up upstairs, just like these two. But these two, a female duo to their male duo dynamic is destroyed and no more. They're tobacconist. They have a tobacconist, of course. Spit, you know, uh, and rinse as the dentist. They said that they uh, says that they both lived in the upper room for years without tenants below. The mother was childish. The two were rarely seen. The daughter, rarer still, adult over child, being a bit domineering, possibly. We're supposed to feel here in the pieces again. Only a fool has facts. You feel for the daughter. You understand, possibly. He also says possibility is more brilliant than certainty because it's where that intersects that you find what others can't. The emotion and the possibility and where they intersect is where you find the most brilliant and hard to find. 
Everyone thought they must have had money stashed away. That would be hidden value somewhere deep and hidden within also, beyond uh, mere appearance. Their banker says that three days before her death, the mother withdrew 4,000 francs in gold, that would be seen to be on the floor, sent to the house with a clerk. I really like this part. The clerk says he took the money with the mother to the house in the two bags, and that when they got there, the mother took one of the bags from him, the daughter the other, he bowed and left. He saw no one in the street at the time. Now we're told so little, but so much more out of this scene, just a bit, it doesn't become the central scene. But of course, we could just hear these rote facts, but we can also fill them with more facts, and I mean meaning and emotions that are possibly there, which aren't absolutely certain facts, but are circumstance and situation. In, in, and the world we occupy, subjective and objective, together. Uh, I, Wittgenstein seems to say, like a duck rabbit, intertwined without the ability to completely separate it. Up, uh, because how else is anything motivated or exist, or why are we paying attention to this story at all? Or invested in attention in any particular thing, like money, or a story, or a murder, or anything else. If there is any, here. So the clerk gets there, the daughter appears, and then he leaves. And then later, immediately here, the cops read more into it, which means they know something about human feelings a little bit, more than we are told by the, of course, this is all through the narrator, that the, the newspaper is telling, the narrator is telling us words putting what we can very much feel, which is a young clerk sees a young girl who is shut up a whole lot in a house, and then we're not told anything more. Well, what do we feel possibly as a possibility when we're told there's a young man and a young woman they by chance to meet, and then he turned, oh, and then I just left, and she has a domineering mother very perhaps? Well, perhaps there's a spark, only perhaps. But that's certainly, as we see here, not what... Du and now that would be, of course, quite simple if Dupin's like, I think there was a spark. Now, he doesn't even have to mention that. The cops are on that one, so he could even become far more brilliant than that. The cops read even into this so far. They're like, okay, wait a minute, which is how they solve it and don't. So, funny enough, we can read this in here and even the cops get to that level and then we're supposed to go with Poe and his detective beyond that and say... That's the most superficial emotional reading of the circumstances. A young man was around a young woman. The whole place got smashed up and brutally all this. Yeah, it's the easiest emotional reading. I can do much better than this. So, funny enough, again, the cops are not uh, foolish in that they have scientific rigid procedures that they can scientifically apply. The Purloin letter makes this absurd beyond this and the descriptions of this. But we can already feel very simple, stupid feelings within the facts and the circumstances, all interwoven in there as motive. Motive in a murder mystery. The first one, perhaps. One of the first. And again, we are coming with more than one twist here. Which are, like emotions, hidden. You can see, you can hear clues. But you have to feel emotions within. And thus, they're only possible. People can fool us. They can dupe us. The, which the police try to do by solving the crime and not, in fact. The police continue to search an interview, but with no further results or clues. The clerk who carried the, mon to the money to the house is arrested, but the paper says nothing incriminated him. So the paper feels enough for the guy and is not on the side of the cops. The paper says, hey, this guy, and them, but they didn't, I don't know, which we can feel the paper's emotional point. Beyond their words, even though they dare not question the cops, simple brilliance of theme here. Again, Poe is one of the architects of the short story, so showing the masses something very simple with simple words that he wants all walks of life to appreciate. The simplest of twists, the most profound of meaning, is what Poe is trying to put in the simplest pages here. The cops are like, aha, that was it. He took one look at her and he's like, that's it. You know, it wasn't her longing him, it was him longing for her. And then he got there and you know what happened. Maybe she looked at him. He was like, hey, he came back later. So that's it. You know, and there's, and the paper says, but nothing else incriminated him, but they're holding the guy. They're holding him, haven't charged him yet, I think, is what they say and imply. But he is arrested. If only four people know about the money and two are dead, and one is a banker, notice the cops arrest the clerk and they arrest the clerk 
who saw the daughter. Dupin seems interested in the case and nothing else, and he says nothing about it to his friend, deep in his own imagination. Now, his friend reads, obviously there's something going on because there's silence from him, and there isn't always. But after the clerk is arrested, he asks the narrator for his opinion, who says the case is unsolvable. That's the narrator. Dupin says, the detective, that the Parisian police are smart, but no more. They're unfeeling. They cannot be genius because they are smart, but not caring, thus ungenius because unfeeling, and it doesn't lead to, with the smarts, greater genius. And process in odd but important situation. He says, the police make a vast parade of measures frequently ill-adapted to the objects at hand. Bit ready to hand. And their successes are due to diligence, much like the narrator has told us chess moves require great attention, but may be too complicated to be ingenious or profound. Again, remember what the narrator is struggling with. See the last talk and me struggling with that. Dupin says the famed police agent Vidoc, a model for Dupin, who also is mentioned around Holmes, had good instincts and perseverance, but investigated objects too close, losing sight of the matter as a whole. Dupin says, and I quote, Truth is not always in a well. There's a wonderful Taoist story about a well frog. I wish, I don't know. Truth is not always in a well. I restart. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial, simple and stupid. To look at things indirectly is the more refined comprehension. By undue complexity, we perplex and enfeeble thought and can make even Venus herself vanish from the heavens. Now, that's end quote. Why is truth superficial? Because motives like love, hate, sex, and violence are stupid and obvious, but move the players, the real pieces in the game, is what is implied from everything we've heard. When we ignore the feelings that frame the game, we make Venus, goddess of love and pan passion, vanish from our thinking. I was going to say panish, as in the camera. Which is making motive disappear from the facts. If emotions are things human beings have, even though they're only possible, possibilities are as we share mentally, physically the world, see my Hegel talks and otherwise, and I'll do more Wittgenstein later, the subjective objective world is possibility because possibility is not certainty. We have to see the world and project it with human imagination. That means the world is subjective as the objective for us because it is what it is and it's possibilities. So if you don't see possibilities and emotions, you can't guess and feel by feeling the motive of the victim, the killer, everybody else, the cops, the uh, guy who was locked up for no reason. Which is why Dupin feels compelled, because he feels for this guy, it seems, at least that's part of what he says, if he may mean more and feel more than that. And he doesn't say that entirely. But yes, is that if you feel for others, you can think facts and math better because you're situating emotions as elements of math, which is the actual situation of murder as well as everything else we get into. So let's get back into this. The clerk Le Bon, the good, the boy locked up, or the young guy locked up, the clerk, not ar arrested unlike the banker, is named Le Bon, literally in French, the good. He's locked up and imprisoned, the good. Poe says in his other work, he says, you know, if I would want to catch an audience, I just bury a girl alive. It's simple, it's stupid, everybody feels for it. I mention that all the time with Poe, because here he has Le Bon, the good guy, he is a locked up. And it's like, well, we're supposed to feel for him, aren't we? That's supposed to motivate us. If you want to keep a, people, uh, if you if you read stuff about writing scripts and writing, I never have or aspire to that. It says in there, keep uh, keep somebody hungry on every page is one of the paraphrasings of what they often say. You don't just describe the curtains for 15 pages or describe a nice landscape. Apparently, amateur writers make a mistake of talking too long and about things and describing too much. Most people want motive and clear twisting and turning of motive and understanding, and you don't get that with long descriptions of things. I'll let long Russian novels remain where they are. Again, so we have here, Dupin fail, feels for Le Bon, and we feel for, and we feel for both, I suppose, who felt for him, and we can, and we can too, right now, with the device of the story, today, right here. It parallels the gold coins in the bag and the loose, varied silver. 
the strict gold and the loose silver itself suggests strict ordered gold as like thought, fact, objectivity, loose mixed silver as human emotion mixture subjectivity, but they're still all in coins and tokens and pieces. So he's seeing the strict and the loose, and he's seeing it together situationally, which is what allows him to think through the extraordinary cases, unlike the cops and everyone else who could just apply brute machinery and rote method of science and reasoning by fact and certainty, unlike the genius who sees intersection of possibility, as it actually exists for all of us, because that's harder to get to then certainty to certainty to certainty, A to B to C of Aristotle, let's say, in the perfect syllogisms. The imperfect syllogisms, interestingly enough, of Aristotle would actually offer such opportunities, but those are somewhat sidelined by Aristotle himself, but not entirely. But that's Aristotle. So, the... Yeah, I have not seen anybody actually suggest in print yet that the gold and then the silver does. And I think that then that actually goes on to have meaning in the story that is significant. That that is like mixing like sort of verbal. I like to think of it as verbal rather than rational reasoning with, emo with emotion, words, and things like forms and symbols, which words and number words are math. Something like symbols and, and things like that, although Poe doesn't divide these because he says poetry. Something like verbal and emotional reasoning, but again, that's not how Poe divides it, and we actually have several different types of reasoning. But we can leave it loose and varied, like the silver. If what Poe doesn't say, but we can imagine if we feel for the clerk, we can say that we saw the, that he saw the daughter, perhaps she smiled at her, him, perhaps she ignored him and he uh, liked her anyway. But either way, the chief locks up the clerk because the chief thinks the clerk wanted sex or money, or both. Like the mattress and the empty safe left as a pair unexplained in the middle of the room, which are a pair, a real red herring, and yeesh. But the clerk couldn't have escaped without being seen by the crowd. And the money is still there, so the chief and cops can't solve the case, but can unjustly imprison someone to make the community feel better and secure their own positions, which feels nice for them. Dupin feels for the clerk and feels the cops are not fully feeling for him, but rather serving their own motives at the expense of the clerks. So it's an interesting act of feeling we can interpret in the police's actions even, reading them, even though they are quite concealed, and at station. Dupin knows the police chief and gets permission to inquire about the case. They go to the house, Dupin examines everything, and on their way home he stops at a newspaper office. He already got it. It's like Columbo. If he shows up at the wrong place at the right time, you know he already knows. But he often suspects his possibility until the end, as strongest. We learn later he has felt out the possibilities, imagined what is most likely, and is setting a trap to test. To test the best of possibilities. To see if he is right. Because he's not certain, because he feels, and thus thinks better than that. Trusting and distrusting himself, rather than simply trusting yourself, like the cops, most arrogantly and authoritatively. Unlike Holmes, who is certain of what he judges as elementary all the time, and doesn't judge, uh, doubt himself a lot. Dupin plays a more guarded game and doubts himself, but doesn't mention either that or his pride, which he may or may not have much uh, again. Dupin says that genius always involves probability which is whittled down by analysis, but not closed out, which would require testing and baiting and switching, etc. Good cop, bad cop, and onward. Dupin says coincidences are stumbling blocks to the uneducated in probability, which is a very interesting, tricky way because he then mocks sort of mathematicians and others. He's actually suggesting emotional poetic intelligence with others, but he says uneducated in probability, and he's constantly guarding his language, but when you feel and read his point between the lines, he doesn't mean probabilities in math. He does. He's actually saying, I can figure out probabilities in math better if I know who's happy or sad about what, because what else do we care or what's else in, what else is important in the situation? Which would be circumstantial and motive. There are no suspects who could have escaped and no motives that make sense, but this actually, he says, eliminates most probabilities and possibilities, giving, leaving us to conclude it could only be something bizarre, a possibility that most wouldn't consider. Dupin says he will or has solved the case. He says that, so he is sure, but not entirely. With as much ease as the cops have difficulties, and he is waiting for someone who is hopefully innocent, but has pistols to detain him just in case. Now, right here, as I've already mentioned and spoiled this a tiny bit, 
I actually think the language is wonderfully duplicitous itself, and Dupin would not know how. He is actually waiting for someone who is, I think, going to slip up and let it be known that he's not guilty of this but other crime. And Dupin says, and it's good they have the pistols, they need them, because actually this is a guy who can or did commit a crime, but it turns out not these. Which actually makes all of Dupin's words turn out to be inclusively contradictory-wise, but inclusively true, which is exactly the kind of form of this kind of stuff. Feeling out how one side sees it this way, another side sees it this way. Aha, the contradiction is actually true as the whole form of it. Dupin says that the women weren't killed by spirits, which some suggest, but the assassin doesn't seem human. He asks his friend to open his mind, open your imagination and feel, Luke. And imagine the second voice, shrieking no language the crowd understands. Dupin says he a thought a posteriori, borrowing a term from Kant directly here, again, constantly suggesting German idealism without directly mentioning it a lot, that the murderer couldn't escape, but he found a window that locks when it shuts, and an incredible acrobat could have climbed up the lightning rod on the side of the house, climbed through the open window, and the window locked after he left. The mother and daughter are frightened of the outside world, reclusive like Dupin and his friend, but they failed to consider the absurd possibility of an acrobatic assassin and left their fourth floor window open. Dupin says, keep these points steadily in mind, the shrill, indecipherable voice, the acrobatics, and the lack of a reasonable motive. The daughter was strangled by hand, not killed with a razor, then thrust up a chimney, which isn't where an assassin would hide a body. Dupin says, this isn't simply odd, but excessively odd, like the extraordinary murders the evening paper announced. Dupin says, the strength to thrust the daughter's body up a chimney, that required several men to get her out, tear her hair out by the roots, and cut a head almost entirely off a body with a razor is quite extraordinary itself. It would require a lot more arm strength than the average person is capable of, which is why some think it's spirits. Again, Poe does seem open to psychics and spirits, but here it's not, and he says that. Poe asks the narrator what he is thinking, and the narrator feels his cr flesh crawl. Wittgenstein says, there's a lot of interesting circumstances where we feel we could answer. The answer's on the tip of your tongue. What's the capital of Columbia? But you think you know, but then you don't. And that's a similar sort of circumstance of something being on the tip of your tongue happens here, but on the tip of his mind and imagination. He says he can feel his flesh crawl as if he can think of something, but not quite. Tip of the tongue as a, with a word in, uh, in another circumstance. And says it must be a madman, some raving maniac escaped from an asylum. Dupin says that madmen do talk in words, however incoherent, and he found hair that is not human in the mother's clenched fingers. Now, that is a little bit of almost a cheating clue. The cops didn't get that. He found it, and you find this in murder mystery stories, Agatha Christie, others, where, oh, but the detective found this kind of hair. It's like, well, yes, if we had that clue, actually, you know, many, yes. Never mind, you know what I mean? And the trouble with writing brilliant murder mysteries with their strengths and problems. But again, he finds this orangutan fur, and he basically can figure this out. Ta-da! Which, again, is a little bit, yes, but love, you know what I mean, and amazement. And so he can show the daughter was not strangled by human hands. He finds animal fur. Now we're told this. Dupin has the narrator read a passage from Cuvier describing the Cuvier, describing the orangutan of the orangutan of the southern islands of Southeast Asia. And the narrator suddenly sees that the murderer could not have been anyone except an orangutan. But who was the other French voice for the Anglais here? Now, it's funny enough, once he says it, the average person can snap into it. This is like genius's glimpses of obviousness, you know? It's like a genius is glimpses of the obvious. That if you're thinking in simple, stupid, profound terms, then once you see it, others should be able to unlock it and see it. Which is why I'm suggesting, once you line this up correctly, you can see that actually there's something else guilty going on here, and we're supposed to probably suspect it, and our minds would go there once it's pointed out. And it's very much like what happens right here. What happens right here is he says, but ah, uh, you got him on uh, the click. Here again, I can make this click a bit in the end. And again, it is possible, not certain, but hey, I'll talk this out. So he says, who was the other French voice though? There's somebody there with the ape, right? Dupin, who has put himself in the place of a madman and then in the place of an ape, he says, I felt, okay, what if I 
Drop my mouse. What if I was a madman? Okay, what if I was an ape? And he says, yes, as soon as I thought that, then I was there. And then I, and I realized, yes, I was an ape. I'm tearing up this place. Okay, so unlike the cops, he feels for a mad orangutan. And he's like, yeah, I'd do this if I was a mad orangutan. That solves the case for him. How simple and stupid and brilliant is that? And he has science and math, which is how he can figure this out, because he also does complex machinations here with all kinds of stuff, figuring out plans and plots and laying traps, which you would need a lot of complex intelligence and book learning for also. So he has the fact learning too, and the knowledges. And so he says he has put himself in the place of the madman, then the ape, that clicked. And so as a possibility, he also found a piece of ribbon outside that sailors used to tie back their hair sailor orangutan a sailor could capture an ape bring it home and lose it so dupin has already taken out an ad in the paper that's why he stopped asking if anyone has lost an orangutan which is why they are waiting with pistols and at that moment they hear someone climb the front stairs hesitate turn and start to leave turn back step to the door and knock with determination now they hear emotional motive and they hear shaken not properly stirred and steady you can see it like you can hear it it's there you can imagine it thus it's right there you can see it in your mind's eye horatio it you can see and hear it and wittgenstein says what is the, the sound of a clarinet you know do you describe it no you hear it you know and you can again you don't know it in paragraphs even experts may not entirely you would hear it and that's what you would have to do as a human being to place yourself there and figure it out so with this there's here's a guy who is the Taoists would say, got to bring in Taoism again. They and then the Zen are just trying to see if you hesitate and see where you're shaking. If you're not, if you're not fluid, you're not with it. And if you shake, again, not properly stirred. They can see when you're shaking. This guy is shaken, then determined, which means he's trying to put up a front at the door of determination, but he's hesitant in, and they've already felt him through the cracks of the door here. Yeah, and heard it. And I heard that. Anyone should be able to read the feelings in these sounds, and we haven't even seen the sailor yet. And here he is. Dupin says, come in, in a cheerful and hearty tone, luring him in. Deception. But he is happy. It's not wrong. It's a, come on in, buddy. Is it deceptive? Yes. Is it truthful? Yes. It's both actually intermixed. Sort of like a bunch of, well, loose change and such. A tall, stocky sailor with a sunburnished face hidden by a beard and a wooden club enters the room cautiously. He has an object to beat people to death with. He resembles an orangutan, orange, hairy, and possibly violent. He looks the ape in the part, and he is armed with a club that could have crushed the mother's body, according to the doctor. It, if we're paying any attention, he comes in armed with what the doctor said could have killed her. But actually, technically, that isn't what Dupin just said entirely, is it? Dupin asks the sailor to sit and says that he envies him as he has caught a valuable beast. He says, yeah, I caught your ape. He's quite valuable. Good for you. The sailor sighs, relieved, and Dupin says he can pick up his ape at the stable in the morning. He keeps the ape with the horses. I guess, you know, in the 1800s, that's where you'd keep an ape in the stable with the horses, of course. That's where I'd keep an ape if I had one, except I have no horses, so I don't know of stables. I would probably take it to the veterinary hospital, you know, but that's me. The sailor says he will pay a reasonable reward, and Dupin says he would like the sailor to tell him everything he knows about the murders the other night as he quietly locks the door, puts the key in his pocket, puts a, pulls out the pistol, and sets it on the table. Good writing. Simple and sweet. And before a lot of other people mimicked all of this, you know, all too many times. The sailor's sunburned face flushes. Funny. He can be even more the ape. An orange. And he rises to his feet with a club, then falls back trembling. Now that's the same oscillating, shaken, not sure of either side, imbalance, improper baby bear theory. Not so Aristotle. At least not the ethics. And then he falls back trembling, the converse of turning to go, but then knocking confidently, like on the stairs that we heard. And now we see him rise and fall back into the chair. The narrator pities him from the bottom of his heart, and we imagine he does, and he's also using his emotions, using his illusion, yes, as Guns and Roses did in the 90s, sympathizing with this dual-natured sailor, both man and beast, violent and victim, gun and or rose, gun with occasional music. Dupin tells the sailor they mean him no harm and says he knows the sailor is innocent, that is also surprising. Now, that is a slap in the face of the audience, and it's awesome. 
because we actually could have all sorts of things to lead us there. But he's already said, well, an ape, ape, ape. He didn't say sailor killed anybody. And then he's like, no, 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 you didn't kill these people. That also can be misleading, as I argue. Thus, we're being set up at each level. It's awesome. Very simply such that following it through shows its genius exactly as Poe and the narrator and everyone tell us through this story. Dupin tells the sailor they mean him no harm and says he knows the sailor is innocent and asks the sailor to confess. And the sailor says he will, but he doesn't believe they will believe him. An extraordinary circumstance. The sailor says he sailed to the island of Borneo and captured the orangutan with a friend who died. He feels the need to mention this. Leaving him with a furious ape on the journey home. He now has an ape to himself. He kept the ape in Paris while it recovered from a splinter in its foot, hoping to sell it. Then, after a night of drinking, the sailor returned home to find the ape had broken out of his closet, furniture, and was sitting in front of the mirror trying to shave with the sailor's razor, imitating human behavior it had seen before, which it had seen through the keyhole, we're told. The sailor pulls out his whip, nice guy, and the ape flees through an open window, given the razor. The ape runs ahead, waits for the sailor to catch up, and then runs ahead again. Now, this is almost like the ape is the object of passion or passion and emotion leading the physical sailor. Like you have two beings. This is very kind of Greco-Roman and ancient philosophy, and it's very kind of almost Aesop, is that you have an ape that is running ahead and then stopping and running ahead and stopping like animals do, interacting with the sailor emotionally as emotion and object and desire or something like that. The lower bestial part of us, according to Aristotle, and passion, which is important to my Carol, but later on that. The, unlike Dupin and the narrator, it also is the gold and the silver, and the loose, the human, the reason, and the emotion. There's a lot of pairing here of duality that suggests reason and emotion. Beyond me trying to parse it into verbal, forget about that. Keep it with reason and feeling intertwined. Don't worry so much about the verbal versus what I'm bringing in too much Wittgenstein. So, the ape sees... Unlike Dupin and the narrator, now they walk together at night arm in arm. These two are broken up. So the duality, like with the women to the narrator, etc., the duality to the pair, the pair to the pair paired here show us something. The interaction to the interaction show us next to each other interaction of simples, thus profound, as opposite groups and pairs. The ape sees something shiny in the mother and daughter's window. Now, that would likely be not the bagged gold, but the loose silver is led by emotion, which is exactly what I'm suggesting is symbolic right here, which <laughs> simply overlaps with the next point as we have on and on and on, which is good writing. Again, simple pivot into something entirely related, but something quite interestingly different. The emotions and motives, not the gold coins in the bags, because how would that shine so much? Maybe upward a bit, but the words and logical reasoning that catches the light as the ladies are up at odd hours counting their money for their own private purposes. Now, I am happy to hear it's possibly also the gold. That's great. I think it does suggest it's the loose silver out which is leading, like the ape is leading the sailor. The sailor who climbs the lightning rod after his ape, thus led, peeks in the window. Can't get in. The ape tries to shave the mother to help her. Now, this is funny. The ape doesn't want to attack them at first, but doesn't know that neither women nor apes shave clearly and is just trying to imitate what's seen with the razor. The mother screams and struggles. Now, this angers and upsets the ape, and with one sweep of its arm, it severs her neck. Now, I also argue here, it's not impossible, but I just have to point out here, I do believe that what Poe is suggesting, and it's possible, not certain, but possible, it's very possible the ape has seen someone slash someone else's neck before with a razor. Because if, they, if we have here very brutally and simply, right, that the ape is imitating human behavior, that it saw through a keyhole, then it slashes with the razor. Now, apes don't grow, you know, have razors in their environment. I do not believe that apes slash with tools. I'm happy to be corrected, but again, I think whether or not Poe or we know that or not of orangutans at the time or now, I think that it is suggesting, but it is subtle. Not so subtle in what happens, the thing. I mean, heck, what else is, what's subtler than that? You know, getting slashed in your head almost clean off by an orangutan with a razor, right? But if it's imitating shaving here, it goes quite unmentioned. And then by the end of the story, it probably saw a razor used both ways through the keyhole. That would make sense. 
And while someone's shaving is a great time to use a razor that way on them and come up behind them and use it. And one could see all of that from the same positioning in the keyhole. But all that is not said, and I'm projecting. But as similar to how Poe tells us to do with both of his main characters. One hoping to catch and understand and imitate the other. Following the passions of his friend. The frenzied ape drops the razor on the chair, strangles the daughter, so the ape is not comfortable, just did the ape doesn't use the razor again. The ape drops the razor and strangles, more comfortable with strangling with the hands, but with the razor in the hand, just spontaneously follows and mimics the behavior, I would say, of the humans. But, I suggest, then dropping the razor more comfortable, because if the ape is comfortable using the razor on everyone, why drop it and use the, well, you know, frenzy, and then... Uh, again, chokes out the daughter, sees the sailor in the window, breaks the furniture, shoves the daughter up the chimney and the mother out the window to conceal its crimes in simple, stupid ways. The ape hurls the mother headlong, he says, Aha, through the window. Somehow she doesn't lose her head, which is barely possible. She barely has a head on. The sailor slides down the lightning rod and goes home, abandoning the ape completely. The voices in the crowd heard on the st- that the crowd heard on the stairs were the sailor outside and the ape inside, not spirits or conjurers or anything. The narrator says he has scarcely anything to add, and that the ape was eventually caught and sold by the sailor to the botanical garden for a good sum. The clerk is released. The angry chief, feel his anger, says people should mind their own business because he is bested and we can feel his hurt pride. And Dupin immediately after we can hear feel that, as we could, following his advice, Dupin says, let him talk as he beat the chief in his own castle. Nicely saying what we can feel. The chief is all flower with no stem. The woman is the neck, as they say in uh, my big fat Greek wedding. Stem would be emotions as the seat of very human and, and uh, not yet Nietzsche again, but Nietzsche. The chief is all flower, head with no stem, heart, all head with no body, all brain with no heart, like Laverna, the Roman goddess of thieves in the underworld, or a codfish, according to Dupin. He says this. Opening quotes are sometimes meaningless addendums and window dressing, as they were in Poe's day, but in the opening quote of the story, we are told, and here I'm going to seg into, that is the end of the story, a reading here of something that's left open. That other sailor died, and there's a lot here hanging here that suggests something. That's just superfluous and window dressing and random it could be, but it lines up something fierce with a detail that is quite unmentioned, and the ending quote says, solve what isn't solved. Why would they say that at the end? Opening quotes, again, sometimes, window dressing. Poe often likes slapping things on things, but he probably didn't do it just randomly without any thought or feeling at all, right? Especially somebody who values his work and thinks himself a genius. In the opening quote to the story, we are told that the name of the song that the sirens sang and the name that Achilles took when he hit among women are puzzling, but not beyond all conjecture. We can figure something out about it. The sirens sing an emotional song that leads to death. Notice emotions leading as the siren song, yes, most famously. But it isn't named with a word. Achilles, it's just a song that they sing. Achilles is a strong, which is emotion beneath the words. Emotion, Achilles is a strong warrior, but he hides under a false name amongst sentimental women, is what we're told. That would be a killer hiding amongst women. Words and names are hard in the emotions of women. Words and names are hard to figure out in such emotional matters, but they are not completely impossible to figure out. The narrator oddly says at the start that a checkers game with four kings I return to could show brilliant moves. And the story, sailor catches ape, mother keeps daughter, chief locks up clerk, and detective captivates narrator. Technically that one's first and last, framing and underlying everything. That's four pairs of pieces, and in checkers, a king is having two pieces stacked. With one subordinate, one superordinate, yes? Superior. Four pairs of pieces, one over the other. Adventure leads to disaster, and injustice leads to justice, as the first pair kills the second, and the third is redeemed by the fourth, and final, and first even. The sailor's ape kills the mother and daughter, and the chief jailing the clerk leads the detective to solve the case. Now that is also like a wrong leading to a right, which is leading with emotion through emotion, and how this is all working, and the understanding here. No one is punished as it seems there is no crime, and if the ape did it, they say, then there are no intentional murders. So there are no murders in the Rue Morgue, we are told at the end of the story. 
but there is one unexplained end at the start of the sailor story, the second sailor. If he had said the murder in the room org, it would have been what I think it is more obvious, and he didn't. The opening quote tells us Achilles hidden unnamed among women, a sailor with a fatal flaw, like an ape with a splinter in its foot. And the name Achilles took is not beyond all conjecture who this guy is. I think that the lover of the queen is to pin himself in the third story to ruin it. But I'm going to argue similarly, and I got to nail it here and just say it. The third story wraps up well in a way nobody suggests, which is Dupin himself is the ex. He's the queen's lover. And it makes so much sense with several of the clues, because that's what you're supposed to figure out if you're simply feeling for what the heck is the ex here and why and who is it. Well, who killed who? Guess who killed who over what? Here already, given the details I've told you. Once you suggest there's something unsolved. And that's in the final quote. According to the final quote from Dupin, there is a master stroke of brilliance in saying what isn't and explaining what hasn't been. Now, after he solves the case, which is true, oh, well, he did that by solving the case, but then he says, but explaining what hasn't been explained. And he leaves it open and hanging like that. Now, that is weird. Now, when I read that ending, it was like, I immediately, the first time I read the story, said, there is a lot hiding here, isn't there? And I got to say, it clicks with this, this following explanation that I got, I think, most fiercely. And well, you can judge again for yourself, please do. Dupin says the best solutions involve probability, and we can say, with reasonable probability, given again how I've already ruined it a bit, that the first sailor cut the throat of the second to keep the ape for himself. It's simple, it's stupid, no one says it, it's almost certain, because again, too much lines up with here, and it allows the reader to perform the exercise in a way that you don't get a chance to, as the reader, to find and something for yourself and play the detective as the audience yourself. And Dupin just mysteriously says, oh yeah, it'd be great to solve what isn't solved here. And he just kind of trails off. And in the next story, the murderer is a sailor. Yeah. The sailor's face is half hidden by beard, but he keeps a razor and says the ape watched him shave. I had one person tell me, you know, I do have a beard. I do have a razor. Occasionally use it. But I think you're right. And I was like, thank you. And I appreciate that. Been growing out. Yes. Not trying to commit murders myself here. But again, yes, I am having a beard that partly shaves your, uh, partly hides your face. Could mean, but how would the ape learn how to shave watching somebody with a beard that would have taken at least, you know, at least half a year, if not more. And I looked it up and the sailing journey doesn't take that long. It did, but not that long to grow a whole beard. So how do you see somebody shave with a razor like he tries to do the mother? Well, he saw the other sailor using the razor to shave who didn't have the full beard. It's not absolutely certain. It suggests itself very well, doesn't it? I mean, how I line up these pieces, unless we're supposed to put it a bit forward. Zen koans work a lot like this. When you put yourself in the position, you think, okay, what if there was a sound that did... You start to feel out what you just talk over and don't think and situate yourself in. So you put yourself in the garden, you think about the rock... Now you start to feel and see it differently, which is what it's supposed to show you. The inner overlapping of many different things and how you can pay attention to what's important and not just what you are paying attention to. Poe borrowed a bit. So he says he keeps a raver and says the ape watched him shave, but he's saying this with a full beard, which seems kind of impossible. It's again, he technically, if he has a very bushy beard, Poe borrowed a bit from the voyage of the Potomac. This is said by scholars, a ship that took a half a year to sail from New York to Indonesia. And that seems to be where he is saying the ape is from. If the sailor's beard is longer than his voyage, he, the ape did not watch him shave. And he, we already know the sailor lies. He might trim his beard a bit with a razor, but the ape does not watch him shave. Again, maybe his neck shaves the neck beard off, but again, it heavily implies the ape routinely through the keyhole watched his partner, who is gone, who is missing, who should be solved as the X that's unsolved. Why is he missing? Well, the simplest, stupidest answer, right? Guy got a valuable ape. What else do you think? So if the sailor's beard is longer than his voyage, he lied. He's a liar, at least. And the ape didn't watch him shave, but watched someone shave and someone then cut a throat. And maybe his partner's th uh, cutthroat and cutthroat happy. But who isn't there and who's standing? And who rose up with a club and then fell back into a chair and is a shaken being and is very much a beast in presentation? Meant to make us think he murdered the women and then didn't. And wouldn't it be perfect? 
It actually turned out that we've been told he's a murderer the whole time and he hid it in plain sight in a murderer, right? Because, of course, he is supposed to make uh, everything about him. This is exactly like a lot of plot twists today, isn't it? Where they twist you and then twist you back to the one that they suggested as a red herring. That's exactly what this is, if I am right. They he, were thrown a very big red herring and then were possibly turned right back around to, to think. If we think through and we pay enough attention, wait a minute. His partner's gone, and that ape saw somebody cl cut a throat at some point through a keyhole, and how many people were partying, and how, yeesh, you know, with these people. Poe partied it up with his brother, a sailor, at nighttime, and friends ranting and raving. The first sailor, it is suggested here, he, Poe also, borrowed a bit from a folk tale, it is suggested by scholars, and in the annotated Poe, about a man who teaches an ape to shave and then tricks the ape into cutting its own throat. Now, if you add that all up together, it is highly suggested the first sailor cut the throat of the second while the second was shaving, giving the first the opportunity, weapon, and motive. The interrelated and woven parts of a murder mystery. Now, this, in fact, here, to get through uh, the last minutes of this, as we are already onward with the talk, Dupin tells us he has a window into others' hearts, but he doesn't get a chance to watch Tells to solve the case so far. But he did, I think, because of what he says suggestively in the end, he solved this one too, and we don't know that. We're not told it. We're told he solved what wasn't the murders, but he actually did solve a murder we are not told of. He reads clues and feels for the ape mother and daughter, but never meets any of them. He feels for the clerk in prison, but doesn't visit him. Dupin feels that he hurt the chief's pride, but after the case is closed. The sailor is the only piece that shows us tells, like in a poker game. And he is easy to read twice, so it would be amazing if he had nothing to do with anything, wouldn't it? It'd be a real waste of an opportunity. He pauses on the stairs before ringing the doorbell and rises from the chair, but remembers the gun, showing he is capable, but also confused and shaken. Dupin tells the sailor he is innocent, which calms him. But the sailor hesitates a third and final time, the moment he thinks of his partner. Just as the four pairs make the moves of the plot, there are four words, coincidentally, that make the most brilliant move of the story, I think, after everything I've said. The sailor starts with his story after a brief pause, and then the narrator summarizes the sailor's story, which strips it of all the emotional tells and the hemming and hawing and everything. So we're only given a moment to read the only character we're allowed with Dupin to see be emotional, and that is he pauses. And then he cuts into his story, and he happens to mention, by the way, I had a friend, he died. As he hurries through his story, or at least seems to because he's a confused, kind of shaken individual. So we're given one emotional tell to read is that he paused, and then we learn his friend is gone after he acquired a valuable ape. This is a very valuable ape. Dupin makes sure to tell him before Dupin learns of the missing friend. So Dupin could not have known how true his words will turn out to be, which is the perfect simple twist for exactly this kind of thing. The narrator summarizes the sailor's story, though, after this pause, and he strips it of all further tells from the sailor. You can see it if you read the story closely, which is awesome. Because it's barely any emotion. And in fact, in a pause, you could say, well, there's no, there's possible emotion in a pause, though. Not certain determinate, but possible motion and then emotion and motion. And then we learn a friend's missing. And a friend who probably was shaving with a razor. And at some point, the ape at the same angle in the closet saw a neck probably get cut. Now, what does all of that suggest in your mind's eye and your imagination and the ways the detective has been saying it? Well, the best opportunity to use everything in the story so far, and again, I, in working this out, is I often do have to say, there's a lot often here hiding in plain sight. Genius is glimpses of obvious because we are all so much the same and can see what we can see, but if it's rare, it feels and connects and is profound. It's a real kick. Is that the sailor, and it is, it doesn't need to be there in the story, but I think it beautifully complements the story in a wonderful way. And I don't think I'm reading too much into it. I think it's all right there, simple, and I'm trying to follow the simple clues as best and simply as possible without overcomplicating it, like we are told. After a brief pause where the, he ends up saying uh, one guy, you know, he disappeared and Dupin says, well, we should solve what isn't solved, huh? Dupin has all the pieces we do by this point. And then you have the narrator in the very beginning, which is why reading the story many more than once and I have a lot. 
A couple times indeed. Lost count is that that you can see that there's a great opportunity to read the sailor one more time here and the pause and to find meaning in it. If we don't, I think it actually is a missed opportunity. I argue thus as only possible, as I should here. Yes? The first death in the story, and if I this is right, think of this. The first death in the story is like the first killing. It parallels it with the throat cut and body left outside. He would be dumped over the side into the ocean. Not so pacific, you know, given circumstances, but, I mean, afterward. With the throat cut and body left in the ocean outside, like the mother, the elder, the older murder, the first one. And the final injustice is like the second killing. With, which is not really a killing, but an injustice. With the clerk, Le Bon, strangled and stuck in a space. So the mother is like the first injustice that goes uh, unmentioned, and the second one is mentioned, but not so much because the cops wrongly imprisoned. Oh, isn't that a shame? Sort of the second injustice, which isn't a murder, is the wrongful imprisonment that Dupin feels enough for and then undoes. Now, why doesn't Dupin solve this hidden crime? Well, what's the easiest answer to feel out in the author Poe, uh, given common human purposes and motives, and Poe and we thinking it's simple and stupid and we're all decently emotionally enough alike, otherwise why have words or talk to each other at all here? You can feel a lot in what I'm saying in spite of a fountain of words and a fire hose, yes? Poe hoped he, we would by following his words, feeling out the sailor and imagining what happened to help us even more in the second following detective story, and I will give a following talk on that, we discover a sailor has killed someone he loves, is the following story. If you wanted another parallel, what did it, and just in case everybody missed that one and they did, what does he come up with as a sequel? Oh, by the way, like my carousing brother, a drunken sailor, like possibly killed somebody, or not so drunken, actually, given circumstances, but an amorous one, one who was drunken in love, I was young and in love, he was certainly drunk on love, if not any, if not schnapps or anything German, you know? So, with all of that, Poe has duped all of us with Dupin since, perhaps, I offer to you. Taking the secret to his grave after he invented the whodunit, because he died three or four years later. Tragically. And I believe there's stuff hidden in Carol that actually Carol did not mention. I believe it's obviously simple Aristotle, because it'd be simple and stupid. And here I actually think, random, I believe... And probably enough, as some may think. I think there's similar things hidden in Carol, but I don't think Carol found this in Poe. I think he knew this story. I can't prove he read it, but he had a book about this story, and he mentioned working backwards, which is what Poe says about this, and he mentions details that sound like he is familiar enough with some of this story, and that he admires Poe for being able to create hidden puzzles backwards. Simple, stupid things anybody could solve, which is the more profound genius, which leads onward to Carol a bit for me. But before that, I'm going to make a video about the second story and a video about the third story. They will be shorter. The second one is not as compelling for me, but is important to make a video about each. Of course, I've made two on this one, at least. And the third story is the shortest. It's I think it's like 20 pages long, but it will be a bit longer than this video on the second because that is possibly, with the first story being the original, the best. Much love is always much happiness, much feeling emotion, the color of your carpet. And I will see you, as always, if I ever do see you.